last year, then these ladies are like, you know, it's a, it's a film about us, made by fucking people that are us, you know, which is amazing. I think that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so So anyway, that, that film clip of, the, of that hotel room, I was there when they were doing it, and as soon as I walked in, you know, before they started filming, it was like walking back into 1963, the Chelsea Hotel, and it was like, holy shit, they got it, they nailed it. It was great, it was so cool, man. But it looked like every other hotel in those days also. It was crappy and it was smelly. And, uh, <laughs> you know, only that one had a lot of famous people in it. <laughs> but it was still crappy and smelly. You know? So, <laughs> You know, back in, you know, in, in the 60s, be, be, before Stonewall, am I in the light? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, in, in the 60s, you know, it was illegal to dress like this, like right? everybody knows that, right? I was constantly arrested every weekend almost for uh, the, the law back then that was called, oh my God, what's the name of the law? No, well, female impersonation, but that's not the law on the books. Sexual deviancy, that's what it was. So my arrest record throughout the years until 73 was a sec uh, sexual deviancy, and that was for women that didn't have three articles of female clothing on, right? You had to have three articles. I never, I don't bra, panties, I don't know what the fuck the other piece was. And how they know I didn't have those on anyway, you know? But almost every weekend I was in jail for that. And for the, for the guys, it was, it was the same thing, you know? For the trans girls, the, the word wasn't trans back then, but uh, for all the girls back then, they had to have three articles of male clothing on, or they, they were going to jail also. And the whole stroll was across the street from uh, uh, the Women's House of Detention on 8th Street and 6th Avenue. So anyway, uh, the other things that was against the law, uh, we couldn't dance together, right? That was illegal, we couldn't dance together. Was we couldn't kiss, uh, we couldn't be served alcohol, it was against the law to service alcohol, uh, and that's why all of these uh, gay bars, you know, grew up out of the, with the mafia, you know, Stonewall. I worked like kitty quarter across from Stonewall in the 60s in a lesbian bar called uh, the Bohemia, and I was the bouncer. And I was about 16 or 17, you know. And back then, you know, the bars were like speakeasies, you know. Uh, and you'd walk into, the, into this lesbian bar, and it looked like a regular bar, right? And then if you kept on walking, there'd be a black door, and you opened up that door, and it was fucking lesbian heaven. <laughs> it was, oh, my God, you know. It was, you know, everything was dark, you know. The tables were painted black, the walls were painted black. They had a jukebox and a stage. And I would sit on the stage, and when the cops would come to do a raid, the mafia guy, Jimmy, was up in the front, and he would push a button under the bar, a red light would go on in the back room, and I would, you know, make sure that two girls or two guys weren't dancing together, like, mix them up, you know, make sure everybody hide their alcohol, you know, because you brought your own, you couldn't be served it, so it was against the law, so you brought your own, and, uh, I, you know, hope that everybody had ID. If you didn't have ID, you'd go to jail. If you they didn't like the way you look, you'd go to jail. Uh, so there's, you know, there's clips in this movie that, you know, was, you know, it just brought everything back to me. You know, like how it was back then, how bad it was fucking bad back then with the cops. You know, I'm not saying that everything was because I had a lot of fun. You know, I was high. <laughs> uh, girls. <laughs> um, it, sorry. <laughs> Wifey. <laughs> I don't do that anymore. I forgot what I was saying. Holy <laughs> shit. I think I thought I was in trouble and was like, I forgot now what I was saying. <laughs> Who was <is> he? Happy. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I had fun. The cops back then were oh, really bad, you know. They were super, super homophobic, especially this guy, uh, Sarge. There's, a, you know, in every story, in every community, and everywhere in the world, there's always a Sarge. 
you know, whether you're in the prison, you're on the streets, somewhere there's a sarge that's rotten. And there was a sarge in the streets back then. And he would patrol from West 4th Street to 8th Street up to Washington Square Park over there where NYU is now. Uh, and he, that was his dis, you know, that was his thing, you know. And when he, when he grabbed you or arrested you, you knew you were going to get a fucking beating. No matter what you're going to be arrested for, you know, and it was always queers, you were going to catch a beating from this guy, you know. And uh, when the, during one of the rehearsals, they had cops, you know, people dressed up as cops, and it was like, oh my God, they look just like them. You know, the same old uniforms, you know. Uh, he's like, oh, you're going to arrest me. <laughs> so the woman's house of detention was on 8th Street and 6th Avenue. Uh, and if, you know, if you were arrested, you, you knew you were going to go there. And sometimes it was good, you know, it was like a playhouse for lesbians. You know, it was, it was, it was, you know. Uh, back then you could smoke cigarettes and uh, I'm talking about, this is, this, this is nothing but the 60s. This is all pre, pre Stonewall. But you could get cigarettes, right? You could take the filter and snap it off, right? So it's not, it's not like it is today where they hit a button and the jail cells all close. Back then the CO, uh, the corrections officer, would come down, crank, 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 and slam all the, 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 the doors, the doors, the cells. <laughs> But if you put, you broke off your filter and you stuck it in the little thing where the lock goes, they come by, boom, 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 and they wouldn't lock them, <laughs> right? They wouldn't lock it. We're jamming the locks. Took them a long time to figure that shit out. <laughs> uh, but you know, the, the CO would you know slam all the gates, right, and then go into the corridor. The house of detention on Eighth Street had four sections. It was cell block A, B, C, and D, and in the middle was where the CEO would sit, right, during the night while we were sleeping, ha ha, you know? So she'd go out there and she'd sit in her little desk and go to sleep with whatever the fuck she was doing, and we would open up our cell doors and everybody would like, chick, 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 chick. <laughs> just, you know, whoever you wanted to be with, that's where you would spend the night. <laughs> you know, uh, also, the 1960s, it looked much different, you know, uh, NYO didn't own anything. You know? <laughs> uh, now they own anything. Is this thing part NYU? Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know! <laughs> it, it is too bad, fuck it. You know? Uh, but, you know, they didn't, you know, it was pretty wild back then. You know, we used to go into Washington Square Park and uh, Bob Dylan, uh, Joan Baez, you know, they would be at the fountain and they would be playing in the early 60s. You know, and making money, and you know, they would always give us change. You know, we didn't know who the fuck they were, you know, uh, but we appreciated the money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, we were homeless. I ended up being in Washington Square Park when I was 13. Uh, I was thrown out of my house for coming out uh, to my father, and uh, he was like, You're out of here. And so I've been on the streets since the age of 13. Uh, maybe until I was 50, you know. I was on the streets for over 35 years. Drug addiction, alcoholism, pimping, jail, armed robberies, white slavery. Uh, oh, white slavery. <laughs> this is also the 60s. I got arrested in Texas. I stole a New York City taxi cab. We used to do a lot in that cab and drove it to Texas, right? <laughs> and asked for a job in Texas. You know, to make, they used to give you gas rations and uh, food rations, right? So I'm sleeping in the backseat with my girl. The gay boy pulls up in front of the friggin' sheriff's office, Van Horn, Texas. Don't ever go there. <laughs> and they came out and they seen us, and we were kids, and they arrested us for loitering and trespassing. Took the, took the car, took our money, and then the girl said, told her real age, she was 14. I lied, said I was 18 or 19 or something, but an adult. They expedited her back to New York. They hit me with white slavery, right? Yeah, you know what white slavery is? I didn't know either. I thought it was because I was white. <laughs> it's not. It's uh, on the law books. It's for the purpose of bringing over, bringing a minor over the state lines for the purpose of prostitution. Uh, 
And I was a pin back then, but that's not, I wasn't doing it then. You know, so I guess I got caught on the back end of it <laughs> anyway. Uh, but anyway, they, they, they hit, hit us with these laws, and I did 18 months in a Texas little small jail. And when they let us go, they gave us back the fucking cab that we stole. <laughs> crazy. And they weren't yellow back then. All of them weren't yellow. We stole a blue, light powder blue, and the doors were fuchsia. Yeah, we're fancy queers. Yeah. But they gave us the cab back, and they gave us some of the money, and we went to a diner because all they gave us was Vienna sausages uh, three times a day and a couple slices of bread and a thing of water, and that was it. Uh, and so we went to a diner to order food, and all we seen was these cowboy hats coming in, and we was like, we take our food to go. You know, it was like the, in the, the old days, like, get out of Dodge, you know? And that's what we did. Ooh. Am I talking fast? I feel like I'm talking very fast. I get so nervous when I do this stuff. You're great. You're great. <laughs> I get, I get so, I get so July, 2013. Dearest Raina. Hi, sweets. I do hope this letter of my love and respect and admiration for you will find you to be well and under the constant supervision of the God of your choice. Okay? I wanted to reach out to you through the bars from the hell that presently confined me and thank you for the peace that you did on Miss Marsha. May she rest in peace. Much like Sylvia Rivera and Bambi, Marsha was my good, good girlfriend. I met Marsha at Johnson in 1977 when I was 13 years old. And I was with her that night she was murdered. She was supposed to meet me at the anvil later that night, but she never did. When Marsha's body was found all bloated floating in the water of her second home, the West Side Highway, several of the working girls, Queens, came forward to report seeing a car full of boys with jersey plates pick Miss Marsha up and drive her off. The 6th Precinct, who at the time had the most notorious bag bashers in the, their employ, police officers Big John and Jimbo Fleming, never went above and beyond to investigate it. Certainly because it was Marsha. At the time, Randy had the lamp store uplift on Hudson Street between 10th Street and Christopher Street. <coughs> Randy was the one to advocate to find Marsha's killers. By turning one of his store windows, into a Miss Marsha Memorial, and the other one, an information center offering a cash reward. She was living with Randy in Jersey at the time, and was a maid in his home. To this day, it remains a cold case. Please feel free to use anything that I shared with you in any of your works. And once again, thank you for highlighting and remembering Marsha P. You know that she was painted by Andy Warhol? The piece called Rag Queen. Much love, Kitty, XO. Ms. Kitty Vitalo, Five Points Correctional Facility, Romulus, New York.
I'm here to disrupt dance every day of my last month. I'm always here, I'm just in this world for the party. Get the point about God. The river keeps on flowing, the water is cool and deep and blue. The river keeps on... <sighs> From Venus and Two Acts. There are hundreds of thousands of other girls who share her circumstances, and these circumstances have generated few stories. And the stories that exist are not about them, but rather about the violences, excesses, and mendacity and reasons that seized hold of their lives, transformed them into commodities and corpses, and identified them with names tossed off as insults and grass jokes. How can narrative embody life in words and at the same time respect what we cannot know? How does one listen for the groans and cries, the undecipherable songs, the crackle of fire in the cane fields, the laments for the dead and the shouts of victory, and then assign words to all of it? Is it possible to construct a story from the locus of impossible speech or resurrect lives from the ruins? Can beauty provide an antidote to dishonor and love a way to exhume body, buried cries, and reanimate the dead? What kinds of stories to be told by those and about those who live in such an intimate relationship with death? Romances, tragedies, streets that find their way into speech and song? History pledges to be faithful to the limits of fact, evidence, and archive, even as those dead certainties are produced by terror. I wanted to write a romance that exceeded the fictions of history, the rumors, scandals, lies, invented evidence, fabricated confessions, volatile facts, impossible metaphors, chance events and fantasies that constitute the archive and determine what can be said about the past. I long to write a new story, one unfettered by the constraints of legal documents and exceeding the restatements and transpositions, which enabled me to augment and intensify its fictions. By playing with and rearranging the basic elements of the story, by re-presenting the sequence of events and diver divergent stories and from contested points of view, I've attempted to jeopardize the status of the event, to displace the received or authorized account, and to imagine what might have happened, or might have been said, or might have been done. By throwing into crisis what happened when, and by exploiting the transparency of sources as fictions of history, I wanted to make visible the production of disposable lies. The second man, huh. I don't know. I have to think so far back. The second man I was in love with, who was that? <laughs> oh. I guess that was um, my husband, 1930, Thomas Gerald Davis. I had Thomas Gerald Davis's. You, I had this black husband, 1970. How he was there? I met him at the gay community center, and he said to me, he said, Marsha, would you marry me? I said, Well, honey, if you want to marry me, dog, you got to go out and get some money and get us a place to stay. And honey, we got married. <laughs> $250 for a park house about 2nd Street, 213 East 2nd Street. And Don, um, we got married that same day. This beautiful black man, Thomas Gerald Davis, buried in Plainfield, New Jersey. Don, who I didn't know the year, he was shot in the heart 
and uh, tried to rob the off-duty patrolman on Christopher's on uh, First Street and Second Avenue. And honey got shot in the heart, but we were married for six months with the gorgeous marriage I haven't had in my whole life. <laughs> I think, you know, we decided that we weren't going to talk too much about the reasons why and just offer up to the community what felt so compelling to us from these clips and from the film. But so much of what we were grappling with as we were making the film is that these are people who were living and navigating immense amounts of violence every day, right? As Jay talked about, and moving through them with an incredible amount of humor or not, or sadness or not, uh, just a range of emotions. And how do you tell stories which is a question that we continue to grapple with, about people who are navigating violence without reducing their entire lives to the sum of those moments of violence. How do you tell stories that spotlight people's incredible amount of agency and power uh, and share their grief without talking about um, them as just people who were victims or had horrible things happen to them? And that's you know so much of what um, we moved away from like telling a factual based story, right? Telling something that said, like, this happened this hour and this happened this hour, in order to really share those moments, those small kind of everyday moments where Marcia and Sylvia uh, and Bambi and Dora had immense amounts of power um, and you know acted um, with each other, right? They shared their power as a form of like relationship um, with each other rather than just like, always defending. Um, and always back. So I think that's one of the really most important parts of this film. So the music that we've been listening to tonight is also the original score from the film that was um, composed by GOI. So I just wanted to say that. And, um, yeah. Yeah. So what we're going to do now is we're going to play one scene from the film. Um, just to give you some context, so we're, we're in the final stages of post-perfection. We're almost done, but not quite. So this is one of the first times we're ever sharing this footage with you. Um, so this is a scene from the film where um, Marsha is, um, she's throwing herself a birthday party, but no one showed up, and she uh, calls her friend Sylvia up to be like, why the fuck are you not here? <laughs> Thank you. 
Lewis, uh, Sylvia Rivera, and Marsha P. Johnson. Um, and we were also, I mean, our enormous cast um, was really incredible. And so were also the people who allowed for that work to happen, right? The people who donated space, who donated time and film and money. Um, and we've just been part of a, a huge community um, holding us up and supporting us. So thank you for like, enjoying that clip that was uh, kind of symbolic of all of that. And we're going to talk more about our cast and, and crew soon. Um, before we do that, we just have a few more clips that we want to share and can have um, a small conversation. We're also going to be outside. Um, but we're going to share one of the really most powerful clips um, of Marsha, um, you know, who was loving Marsha um, in the 80s, giving soul poem. Um, uh, Jimmy, can you share? Just to say, I feel so nervous like sharing some artwork that I've been working on with Sasha for just a huge amount of time, and it's really amazing to be in community here um, sharing with people in my life. Oh, my God. 
what research that you've done, and, and where, and if where at all do you, if at all do you, kind of fictionalize? Um, so, so the script is just looking at kind of this one night turning into day and then into night again, um, and definitely we, you know, what we could. I'd say that the film is definitely very much rooted in a lot of the archival research that we did um, in terms of some of the characters that appear, some of the, the ways that people talk, some of the stories they tell. Um, but we also, well, one thing that we found out while we were making this film is, you know, we always heard the story about it being Marsha's birthday. Um, and then on our research, we came across her birth certificate. And um, we're both cancers. And we thought that Marsha was a Cancer, but turns out she's a Virgo. Yeah. <laughs> the biggest surprise in our research. Um, and now it makes so much sense. But, um, and we were like, uh-oh, we wrote this film called Happy Birthday, Marsha, and it's about a birthday, but it wasn't a birthday. We had this whole conversation about, you know, should we change the story? Should it just be a party? Um, and then we realized that it didn't really matter, right? It, it was okay to, to continue um, to sort of maybe perpetuate this, this myth um, because really the things that we wanted to get right in the story or um, not necessarily get right or accurate, but the things that we wanted the story to emote are there, right? And that was really looking at not this one single person throwing a shot glass or a high heel and starting a riot, um, not just this one person, this one moment, but all the kind of social relationships um, that were taking place that made that moment possible um, to resist the police that night. So there's a lot of stuff in there that's definitely very much rooted in, in you know, almost a decade of research, but then there are things that um, we felt like served the, better, served the story better um, to tell the truth that we wanted to tell. Just to add, you know, um, a few things. So, a lot of the traces and imprints of um, Sylvia and Marcia and Bambi and Dor are really scattered throughout New York and uh, throughout a lot of places, right? They're not um, necessarily like held in official archives, right? And, but occasionally they are. But not saying that this is like um, an archive dedicated to Sylvia or Marcia. They're held by the memories of some of the people who are like, in this room tonight, right? Um, and they're held by people who we talked to. We did a lot of um, interviewing, hanging out, um, just a, a lot of like formal kind of like going, trying to be as um, at first like accurate and then uh, later as truthful, right? And so one of the things that happened was during our process, we um, were really. I still feel so vulnerable and nervous sharing something that's so meaningful. So it's like, you know, I do like speaking for a living, but tonight I'm like, I can't really talk. Um, so, I, you know, one of the things that was really um, influenced us was this article that we read a little bit by Sadia Hartman, who's an English professor at Columbia. It's called Venus and Two Acts. And in the article, she talks about her own experiences trying to write about the lives of people who were stolen and moved across the transatlantic slave trade, right? So um, people who were black and whose only traces were in insurance books, right? Um, and, and the insurance letters. And for her, and what we, the excerpts that we read, for her it was more important to not tell a, a story based in fiction, right? Because fiction is so tied to um, legal documents that were never really like built to hold the lives of people navigating oppression and marginalization, right? They were built to hold the, you know, the stories of companies who own people as commodities. And so for her, she was saying, I want to write a story that exceeds um, the fictions of history, right? The things that are fact-based that we're told that's how we want to like, share stories. I want to say something that's truthful rather than accurate. I want to say something that's truthful rather than fact-based. I think for us, we really are trying to not be the um, like the mirror reflection or the accurate reflection of that horrible Stonewall movie, right? We're trying to be like a truthful film that is about supporting 
and uplifting and really spotlighting the lives of um, so many people that allowed us to be on the stage, right? And cast and write, written by people who um, you know, are living in the legacy of Silver Bear and Marshall Johnson, um, some of whom are here today and influenced by you know, people who knew her, Jimmy Kamichia, who's in our film, was Marshall P. Johnson's director in The Hot Peaches, right? So um, she was like a, an amazing performer, and so Jimmy spent a lot of time with us um, working with Maya Taylor, kind of getting uh, Maya's voice like very Martian on it, and also just sharing stories. And so that, um, I don't know if that answered your question perfectly. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I knew Marsha very well. And I was nervous coming in here as a fellow cancer. You know. <laughs> uh, a real and, cancer. And um, I think it's important that, the, that the, the bio that David's working on be done and be done well. But tonight you brought for me Marsha, the Marsha that I knew. You know, the, the actors were wonderful because they really had worked on the language and the, and the inflection. But just the footage of Marsha, um, I can't tell you what it did to me. Uh, and, and, and for everyone here, I mean, I had the privilege of knowing Marsha. Uh, Marsha lived for what's now called pride. You know, I mean, that was the happiest day in Marsha's life. And you know some of the stories of what happened to her in the, in the march, but... There was, with all the street experience that Marsha had, there was an enormous innocence and joy about being, I guess Marsha would have called herself gay at the time, but being this person who really loved life when she was around her community. And the clips that I saw absolutely captured that. So thank you very, very much. So the, um, the footage that you saw of Marsha sitting at the table of this like, bowl of fruit next to her and, um, is, is actually interesting because when, as we were talking about earlier, when we originally started this project we thought we were making a documentary and then we felt very limited by the archive and kind of branched out and started to explore through writing a script. But we still always felt like there was a place for maybe some sort of archival in the film and um, after we'd already shot and were cutting the film, we were put in touch with someone named Darren Wilson, who's a film professor at NYU, um, and he wrote us and said, I have this uh, footage that I shot on VHS in 1991 in my basement with Marsha. Do you want to come see it? And so, of course, <laughs> I said yes and freaked out. And then we went and we sat in the dark and watched this footage and just... It's, it's, in, it's incredible and um, very intimate, um, and it so much resonated with the script that we're making, and so it became a really important um, kind of structural component of the story. So, so it does have this sort of um, feel where you're moving through archival and through narrative scripts and sort of um, channeling Marsha in our film. So, yeah. Maybe one more question. We're also going to be yes. um, hanging out <laughs> at that. So. Thank Let me hear you say, hey, Ms. Biko. Hey, hey Ms. Biko. Biko. Hey. Um, <laughs> I just want to say that working on this project um, was life-changing for me and that it is one of the proudest things that I've ever been able to accomplish. And speaking of archiving and documenting these moments, I wanted to know if we could get everyone who was involved with the film on the stage for a quick photo. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think we'll do thank yous, and then we, what we can do uh, for folks who are able uh, to be on. I think actually maybe let's do a, uh, a photo outside, just for, you know, for access purposes, so people don't have to come up. But um, I think that makes so much sense, right? We're gonna, we're gonna document these moments. And thank you for being part of the film. Thank you, Raina, Sasha, and Jay. Please come join us outside in the gallery and bring in talk. Thank you. Thank you.